Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Kathy and I'm an alcoholic. And today I know that 100%. I know in my innermost soul that I'm an alcoholic and the illusion that I can drink like other people is smashed. And I spent almost 13 years in this program and didn't know that. I thought that I was, 90% of me thought I was an alcoholic. 80 to 90% at any given time thought I was an alcoholic. But that was just enough for what my sponsor calls slick, the disease, for slick to to get in there and after almost 13 years for me to think it was okay to drink again. And I'll talk about that more in my story. Um, Like I said, my name's Kathy. I'm an alcoholic. I sponsor. I have a sponsor. I have the best home group in the world, the fifth edition. I love this home group and I've just been a member for about three months and I've been looking for a home group like this for years. So it's just, you know, it's wonderful. And all I can say is if you're not proud of your home group and love your home group, then get another one because I've never felt so plugged in before to a home group. And uh, let's see, I was born a long time ago <laughs> in Cleveland, Ohio, and You know, like the other speaker was talking about, a lot of people say that, you know, they were born, they didn't feel right, you know, growing up. And I was one of those people. I felt like I had a hole inside me. There was something missing. I just always felt like that. I grew up in an upper middle class family. On the outside, everything looked good. Everyone dressed good. The house was beautiful. My dad owned a chain of furniture stores. Everything was great. But inside... Uh, We were emotionally, spiritually bankrupt. And my mother was in and out of this program for years. My dad, I think, was probably an alcoholic. My brother was an alcoholic um, also. He was in this program for 10 years and then thought he was cured and never made it back and hung himself about two years ago. This program does kill, So, and I am really serious about it. So anyway, um, you know, I felt like there was something missing. Um, one thing I loved was when my dad took me to work with him because I was always Larry's daughter and I felt like I was a movie star. They just, everyone there treated me like so well and it was, you know, because they wanted to, you know, impress the boss. So I, they just treated me and, and, you know, I was a princess, I'll admit it. Um, and I loved that part of it. But, You know, I would go home and be in my room for hours listening to music and just um, feeling like there was something missing. And then when I was 11 years old, we were at a function in New York, and my cousins gave me a 7 and 7. And I remember how it felt going down. I remember it filled the hole. It was the first time I felt complete. And it was warm, and my parents saw that I had this drink. And they were not happy. And I asked for another one. And they said no. And I said please. And they said no. And then it was the first time Slick talked to me. And Slick said, don't blow it. At least you know it's there. At 11 years old. (laughs) And I remember that. Don't blow it. At least you know it's there. And after that, you know, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities to drink. um, But whenever there was one, I would take one up. And, And some people... They they tell their story and they drink normally for a period of time and then they cross an imaginary line and they say that a cucumber turns into a pickle. Um, but I was a pickle. I always drank like a pig. I drank. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted more. Um, there was never enough until I was passed out or thrown up or over a toilet, something. I mean, I always wanted more. So I drank in high school when I could. Um, in college was where it really took off. I went to a college, Ohio University, and we had T-shirts that said, "Oh, you is not a party school; it's the party school." 
And we did, you know, I drank six nights a week at least. And what happened one night was I went to happy hour. And then I passed out, and some of my friends came and knocked on the door, and I said, what time is it? And they said, 1.30 in the morning. I said, it is not. Let's go out. And they said, no, it really is. And I missed the night, and I was so pissed. I said, I missed the night. I said, I'd never do that again. So I would white-knuckle it until about 9.30 at night because I didn't drink beer. I never saw a reason for drinking beer it just made me go to the bathroom and the only time I drank wine was when I wasn't drinking was <laughs> <laughs> so, so um so I would wait till about 9:30 at night and then pound them pound them pound them for as many hours as I could and you know I would just get drunk well, I got a call my junior year from my mother or from my father saying my mother's an alcoholic. She's at Ridgeview in Atlanta, and I had to go for the family weekend. And then I thought, well, if she's an alcoholic, what am I? Um, she just wants attention. That was what I thought. <laughs> and so um, he wanted me to go to an Al-Anon meeting. So I went to half an Al-Anon meeting and thought it was bogus and wound up, got drunk. And then after a little while, there was about a week in between, I thought, well, maybe I have a drinking problem. And I went and I saw a counselor at school, and there were like three tiers of ten questions. Um, if you've done this, you're an alcoholic. And I had answered up to two of them on the last tier, but I still said I wasn't, that I was a problem drinker. And what I wanted to do was start a club at my school for people like me that had a problem with alcohol and have meetings like Alcoholics Anonymous did, what I thought those meetings would be like. And then we go to the bars and control each other's drinking. <laughs> and at the time, there was a guy named Doug Talbot who ran Ridgeview. And I wrote him a letter um, telling him about my idea and asking for a meeting with him so that he could help me implement my idea at the school. And so I came to Atlanta and realized at the beginning of this family workshop through a counseling session that I was an alcoholic, and the counselor said, you're trying to do step 12, and you hadn't done step one. <laughs> so by the time uh, I met with Doug Talbot, he held the paper up, and I started crying and said, I'm trying to do step 12, and I haven't done step one. And he said, you here now. And my mother left. Her time was up. She left me her clothes. She left me her clock radio, and I went to Ridgeview. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the halfway house. I went to a three-quarter way house, and then what I call my own apartment, a four-quarter way house. <laughs> and, you know, I remember, if anyone knows NABA, that was where I got sober, and I would, I would go in there, and I would just think, this is like purgatory if you're Catholic. This is where I go until I die. And I'd see everybody. <laughs> I'd see everyone with those bright, lighted eyes up. And I just thought, you didn't get it. I thought you had frontal lobotomies. And I wanted to shake you and go, don't you understand how things are? And life sucks. What is your problem? And I just, I, I, and I, I was all these old people, I called them old farts. I was 21 at the time. And there weren't a ton of young people. And... I just thought I was doomed to be with old farts the rest of my life and be bored. And, I, you know, there was a time that I said to myself, I don't know for sure that I'm an alcoholic, but I had nowhere else to go. And this seemed to be a great way of life, and I might as well do the deal. Um, but I never admitted to my innermost self that I was alcoholic, and the illusion that I could drink like other people wasn't smashed. I thought it probably was, but I didn't think it was for sure. And so, you know, I went through the steps. I got a sponsor. I did a bunch of fourth and fifth steps. I did amends. Um, it's like you build a house on a foundation of sand, and it can be a beautiful house, but eventually it's going to come tumbling down, and that's what it did with me at 12 years, 11 months, and two weeks. I met my ex-husband in NABA, and when I was less than a year sober, and we wound up getting married for all the wrong reasons and wound up moving back to Cleveland so that he could work at my dad's furniture business. And we wound up having two children uh, who I adore. 
and I wound up joining these playgroups, these mommy and me Jewish American princess playgroups. <laughs> and, you know, I had two lives then. I had my AA life and my princess life, and never the twain would meet. And, and in these playgroups, all they talked about was their husbands and redecorating their houses. And I just felt like I wanted to die in there, you know. And, you know, I went to meetings, I spoke, I sponsored people. But it gradually got less and less and less and less. And I wound up divorcing my ex-husband, and he moved back to Atlanta. And I had the kids, and... Then I wound up meeting another man who was my ex fiance and started drinking with him. And when I drank after all that time, it wasn't some big, huge thing. It was little. I was at a di dinner for my birthday with my parents, and my dad wanted me to try on this sweater um, at the restaurant, and I was embarrassed. And I was pissed off. And then he let my brother choose the restaurant for his birthday but he didn't let me choose the restaurant for mine. So I thought after that, that you know, um, was cause to drink after all that time. <laughs> so, it, and it's, it's not, and I say that because slick, the, the alcohol is the last part of the relapse. You know, the alcohol is the last part. It starts in the mind first, and it just goes on and on. It's almost like at the end, it's like it's okay, a toast to the relapse, because it was... It's the last part of it. And a friend of mine uh, who was a singer in this club, kind of like Morton's, it was a steakhouse, and she was the lounge singer, you know, said, if you're going to drink after all that time, you're going to have the best, and gave me some Moet champagne. So I drank that and thought, okay, the world didn't explode. It's okay. Well, within a month, it was as if, not as if I drank that, whole time. I mean, it was as if I had been drinking the whole time. I didn't pick up where I left off. It was as if I had been drinking that whole time. And I started, you know, playing tricks on my ex-fiance, like I would say, um, I'm going to get dinner at a restaurant, and I purposely wouldn't order the dinner. I'd go there and order it so I could have three drinks before taking taking it home, and then having wine with him. And I would hide, you know, I'd hide bottles of wine in my um, cosmetic case in the bathroom. I didn't drink, you know, I said my children weren't affected because I didn't drink till in the evening. But that's a lie. You know, I wasn't there emotionally for my children. I wasn't there spiritually for my kids. You know, I was living to drink. And, it, you know, it was either um, I was hungover I was getting ready to drink. I was excited trying to get the kids in bed and all of that. I had somebody from the program actually living with me, paying um, paying me a little bit and then helping take care of the kids. So I had a built-in, you know, and she was concerned about me too. And so I, you know, did this um, off and on for about three years. And, you know, finally one night um, I wound up not coming home. And my kids were supposed to be at school, and I got a call from my friend who lived with me, said, where are you? And I said, oh, my God, and she got the kids to school. And I realized at that time, I didn't realize that I'd like to say, oh, my God, I have a problem, but it was like, oh, shit. If I don't say I have a problem, I'm going to get a whole bunch of crap from a whole lot of people. So I said... Oh, I realize I'm an alcoholic and I need help, so I got to go into a treatment center and not, you know, get the crap that I would have gotten. And, you know, I then made my way through a bunch of treatment centers, you know, and I called myself, at the time, Siskel and Ebert were big critics, and I called myself the Siskel and Ebert of treatment centers, you know. <laughs> the food is good at this one, they work the program good at this one, the men are cute at this one, you know. <laughs> And I just probably went through six or seven of them. I never actually counted. And at one point, my dad called my ex-husband, who had then moved back to Atlanta to be with a girlfriend, you know, and said, it's your turn to take these kids, and she needs to get sober. So my kids, it was a summer, came back to Atlanta, and they um, went to Conyers, Georgia. That's where he was living. And that godforsaken place. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I lived there 12 years. It was very nice. 
But um, <laughs> anyway, so um, he was there, and I was in a treatment center in Ohio, and I had a weekend away and thought it would be a good idea to go dancing, and they found out, and then they said I couldn't have my kids the next weekend, so I left and took off and drove to Atlanta. And I, I want to back up, too. I want to tell you the time that I knew for sure I was an alcoholic. This woman who had um, given me that Moet champagne, I called her one night, and I said, Debbie, do you think I'm an alcoholic? And she said, well, I don't know. I don't exactly know what an alcoholic is. All I know is when you put alcohol in your system, um, you don't act like the rest of us, and all you have to do is keep putting more in your system. And I started crying, and I said, that's what an alcoholic is. But I didn't stop drinking after that. Um, I knew that I was an alcoholic, but I wasn't willing to get sober. And so um, after that, I didn't really drink thinking this time it's going to be different. I drank saying, get the pain away. I'll deal with it later. So I got to Atlanta and went to some halfway houses around here, went to Mara, went to Turnaround. Um, you know, the, the class of the halfway houses just definitely kept going down. I went to some others, and then um, <laughs> then I, um, I would drink, and then I had, I did get 10 months, and when I got the 10 months, it was, after that was the last time, and what happened was I was with a man in, uh, in North Carolina who had at one point been in this program, and we were with another woman and man who were treatment center counselors. I mean, I thought it was a safe thing to go away with this guy. Well, after we were with them, we went by ourselves, and he pulled out, and I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, it's pertinent to my story, he pulled out some crack cocaine. And my thought was, what if I die and never get this experience? <laughs> and, and the thing was, you might say, oh, well, she didn't have a relationship with God or her higher power, but that's full. I did. I had prayed in the morning. You know, I prayed on my knees to keep sober. I had journaled, and I did have a relationship with my higher power, and it took me several years to realize how that could happen. How could I have a relationship with a higher power and yet do crack cocaine? Um, and I finally realized God was my higher power, but God was not my highest power. My highest power was a man and a drug and a thrill. And so as I'm smoking crack cocaine, we are arguing about whether I need to pick up a white chip in AA. <laughs> because it was an alcohol. So what I did, some of the, the other people that were there were drinking beer. I grabbed a beer, downed it, and said, there, now there's no question. <laughs> so... And I still have no opinion on the issue, but um, I knew that I qualified to pick up another white chip in AA. And after that, I went to, I, we got back, I went to 8111, and people surrounded me. You know, 8111 is a clubhouse, if you don't know. Um, and people surrounded me. They didn't leave me alone for three days. I stayed at people's houses. And, you know, that was the last time that I had a drink or anything else. But, and this is why I really believe in singleness of purpose, because... I was in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, feeling like I was going to die. It was almost like at that point I was looking, because I did this crack cocaine for a whole weekend, you know, got on the floor looking for it. He was lying about where it was and picking pieces and the whole thing and went out to the crack dealer, kind of got a crash course in it. And, <laughs> and I just thought, I'm not going to get sober. I mean, I can't do this. I just can't do this. And I knew what would happen if I kept on with the drug to me quickly, very quickly. Um, that would have been like the 50-year-old lady that the first speaker was talking about. Um, <laughs> if, you know, if I would have keep, kept doing that. And so somebody, a friend of mine said, why don't you go to CA? And I said, well, I'm not a cocaine addict. I just did it for the weekend. 
But then I thought, well, do you do crack socially? Is there a social group? So I didn't know, but they said, just, she said, just go trust me, go to this meeting. So I went to this Friday night meeting, um, and there was hardcore, hardcore recovery of the big book of AA. I'd never at that point seen anybody work the AA program the way these guys did. And I went to a big book study, and I remember the first big book study, there was this really cool, slick, mean, I thought, sarcastic guy running it. And he said to me, you know, what do you see on the first two pages of this book? And I said, nothing. And he said, well, that's what you know about recovery, nothing. You know, but I had had 12 years, 11 months, and two weeks. But at that point, I was willing to do anything. I was willing as the dying could be. I knew I was going to die if I went out there, and I had to eat my ego and just say, forget it. So I did what they said, and then, you know, I worked this program. I did, you know, all the steps really hard, and I admitted that, you know, I was powerless over this thing. And I had never been taken through the book before, and I had always skipped the doctor's opinion. Um because it was on Roman numerals. And I knew there was something physical <laughs> in your system, but I didn't understand the physical allergy. I didn't understand the mental obsession, and I didn't understand the spiritual malady um, at all until someone took me page by page through this book. I didn't think I related to Bill at all. Um, you know, I skimmed through Bill's story. There's so much in there. You know, anybody in here who's a real alcoholic, I think, can relate to the line in Bill's story that says, no words can tell of the loneliness I felt in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. Alcohol was my master. I could relate to that. And I never saw it before that. So I went through the steps and, you know, started sponsoring, and things went pretty well for a while. But then what I did at around seven years sober, um, I started trying to stay sober on yesterday's spiritual experience. I tried to think that it was, if I did enough 12-step work, it excused me from 10 and 11. And I stopped doing, that if I was taking you through the work, that meant I was going through the work. And I hear there's a faction of people who believe that, and that scares me. Because that's like saying, if we're at the gym, and I'm coaching you, and you're on the machines, that I'm going to get in shape coaching you on the machines or, you know, and that's just not how it works. And, and, you know, as a sideline, I'll say that they say this program is suggestions, but, and the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking, which is true. I can be a member of AA, but not a member of the Fellowship of the Spirit that it talks about on 164 that we, you know, that we go on to happy destiny with. It's required that if I want to get in shape, which I do, but I'm not willing um, right now, is <laughs> that I have to get on the machines and I have to diet. I have to do those things. I can't watch, I can't go to the gym and watch you work out. I can't have all my stick, hang out with my stick, you know, friends, figured friends and beautiful friends and think I'm going to lose weight because I'm not. I have to actually do the work. And if I want to live happy, joyous, and free and be sober, I have to connect with a power greater than me. And the only way I can do that, because I'm a real alcoholic, is through working the steps of recovery. Um, some people can come to this program and not do that. And I'm not to judge who's a real alcoholic and who's not, but I've seen people they come in, they were heavy drinkers, and they liked what we had. They liked the fellowship. They never worked the steps. They come to a couple meetings a week, and they're fine, and their lives get better. And why can't that be me? Because I'm, I'm a real alcoholic. I have to do this stuff, and I have to do it hard, um, because otherwise I'm going to die. So going back to what I was saying is the seven years, I felt like I was going to die. I'm doing big book studies. I'm sponsoring women. I'm doing all this stuff. Um, I could get up here and speak and you'd think that, you know, I was Miss Sober, but I was dying inside and I didn't want to drink. And the book says at one point, it says, you know, that we've recovered from this and that we wouldn't drink if we could and we couldn't if we would. I didn't want to drink. I just wanted to not exist. 
And all I knew to do was I started calling mental institutions. And I said, there, you know, there's something wrong with me. And at that time, I didn't have insurance. Well, there was a friend of mine, and this friend was, I use the term loosely, he was a really good friend, but he was like my nemesis. Like, I used, I had a dream once that my big book study, I did his big book study. <laughs> and that's how sick I was. And, and I... I, ha I was at um, one of the conventions um, in July. I forgot which one it is. Um, the one, um, anyway, the one in July, and I couldn't get a hold of my female friends, and I just kept bumping into him. And, you know, I told him that I just felt like I, I, I was falling apart. And he had just gotten a sponsor, Mark H., from Texas. And this guy, Mark H., took him through the work in the book so intensely that he was, he had just gone through and he was on fire. And it, it, the way that it was still through the book, but it was a way that was very, very intense and a way for that he, this guy, Mark H., took a lot of people who had 10, 5, 20 years sober that were miserable through the work again so they could be happy, joyous, and free. And so he asked me if I was willing and if I wanted to go through the work. And I do believe men need to sponsor men. Women need to sponsor women. At this time, I had no choice, and there were no women in this area that had gone through it the way like this. And he told me, said, I want you to say this prayer. It's, God, please set aside everything I think I know about you, the program, the book, so I could have a new experience with all these things. Please help me see the truth. And so I prayed that prayer. And I had to, you know, my knowledge of AA and my knowledge of the big book was like the noose around my neck that was going to kill me. And I had to forget all of that and be willing to see it with new eyes. And, and I was trying, and he would tell me to do stuff, and I would do it, and I was trying, and I was still miserable, and I tried so hard. And I said to him one day, I can't do this. I said, I've tried everything. I give up. And he said, good. He said, now we can get started. And we got started with the work, and, you know, I realized that, you know, I could recover from this thing, not be cured. I could recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body um, that I could, you know, not have the, if I am spiritually fit, I'm not going to have the obsession to drink. If I don't have the obsession, I'm not going to put it in my system, and if I don't put it in my system, I'm not going to crave it. I'm not going to have the physical allergy. But even if I'm spiritually fit and you take alcohol and put it, make me drink it, I'm going to break out in the craving because I have that physical allergy. So I'm never cured of this thing. And I realized that my life run by me is unmanageable. Uh, someone said I fired myself as manager due to poor performance. <laughs> and that's what I had to do. And I had to, you know, my ego was, you know, was big still, you know, because the ego recreates itself in AA very quickly. And, um, oh, yeah, I've got time. Um, there's a guy named Harry Tebow. He was one of the founders of AA. I mean, with Bill, if I can find this thing. And if I can't, I'll just tell you what it says. But here it is. This is from AA Comes of Age, which is an AA-approved book. It says, Dr. Harry Tebow, one of AA's founders, writes in AA Comes of Age, 31, 311, 2, the so-called typical alcoholic is a narcissistic, e a egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence, intent on re maintaining at all costs its inner integrity. Inwardly, the alcoholic brooks no control from man or God. He, the alcoholic, is and must be master of his destiny. He will fight to the end to preserve that position. If the alcoholic can truly accept the presence of a power greater than himself, he by that very step modifies at least temporarily and possibly permanently his deepest inner structure. And when he does so without resentment or struggle, then he is no longer typically alcoholic. And the strange thing is that if the alcoholic can sustain that inner feeling of acceptance, he can and will remain sober the rest of his life. So the ego just recreates itself. That's why I do the steps. I try to do them like every year um, because the ego recreates itself. And I realize things that I didn't realize before 
And as great as a nightly review as I might try to do, I don't see everything, and there's new damage that's, that is created. But anyway, so, I, you know, and then the second step, you know, made, um, what is the second step? Um, <laughs> um, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Thank you. Um, I believed that the power could. I didn't always believe the power would. And what really helped me was the book says as soon as a man could believe or um, was willing to believe, he was well on his way. So all I had to do was be willing to believe it was possible, that there was a millionth of a chance I was wrong. You know, if there's a millionth of a chance I could be wrong, that hoop that we have to jump through is pretty large. And in step three, when I made a decision to turn my will, which is my thinking, and my life, which is my actions, over to the care of God, as I understand God, I'm giving over me. In the first step, I'm giving over alcohol. In the third step, I'm giving over me. Um, or I'm, I have made the decision to give over me. I'm not actually giving it over yet. You know, they told me four frogs were on a log and one decided to jump. How many are left? Four, because he just made the decision. He never did anything. So, you know, it, and then the book says next we vigorously, you know, did more work. And so then I had to start this four step. And this four step that... Um, I did was the most intense four step I've ever done. It was the way that the book says with the resentments and with the columns, but it had an expanded third column. And so it not only was able to isolate my defects of characters, it was able to isolate the roles that I play. Because who I am, you know, is not my job. Who I am is not an alcoholic. I was me before I became an alcoholic. I, who is me is not a mother. I was me before I became a mother. Who is me is not a daughter because I'm still me and my parents are dead. So who am I? And these are different roles that I play. And when I was able to isolate some of the roles that I played, I was able to be a little lighter with them and recognize that's not who I am at my core. Like one of my characters is Miss AA. And if we go to meetings and somebody's talking about their drug this and drug that all the time and I get really mad and I just am indignant and now I can go, who's upset? Oh, it's Miss AA. Chill. And, <laughs> you know, it's not, but that's not, but I used to really believe my own bullshit, you know, that, that it was up to me to correct this and I thought I was the AA police and, and I'm not. So, um, Anyway, so that expanded third column really helped. And then I realized what the book said in between the third and the fourth column, which it says once we did this, we, we looked through it carefully. We were, <clears throat> and the first thing apparent was that the world and its people were, were wrong. So I could look at the first two columns and say, yeah, everybody's wrong. I resent this person for this thing, and they're all wrong. So then we look at the list again, and the next thing that comes to us is the world and its people really dominate us. So I look at the third column, and there's all this stuff there, my self-esteem, my security, my this, my that. Yeah, the world and its people dominated us. So then it says, how can we escape? And it gives me some prayers to do, um, to pray for the other people and, you know, to pray to treat them like I would, you know, like a sick friend and, you know, ask God what I could do to be helpful, not ask the sick person what to do to be helpful. To be clear about that, I ask God what to do to be helpful to them. And then I go on with my fourth column, putting out of my mind all the wrongs that um, that they've done. It says we resolutely look for our own mistakes. And I don't look for my part. This guy who spoke here a while ago, Bob D., um, I heard this from him. He said, if I look for my part, then I'm looking at it in light of what you did, because that means you have a part. What I do is if that person was absolutely perfect, I look for my mistakes. My husband might have swore at me on the phone, told me, said the worst things to me, and then I called him a a-hole and hung up. Just because he called me all these things doesn't make it okay for me to swear at him. If he was perfect, what did I do? Um, so... 
you know, in light of that. So the fifth step took 11 hours. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but in the middle of the fifth, and normally for the newcomers, fifth steps don't take 11 hours. <laughs> um, but this was pretty intense, and I had built up, I guess, a lot of wreckage. But in the middle of it, I started crying. And I just started crying and crying and crying. The only thing I could say was, I'm a poser. And that word is a young people word for being fake. I couldn't think of any other word to use, um, meaning I was inauthentic. You know, I just was a wannabe. And I just realized, and everything came crashing down, that I was just, a, you know, I was a fake. I was inauthentic. And I didn't want to be that way anymore. So, you know, I did the rest of the step and then, you know, took the time in between and did some writing in between, looked over everything that I had done. And then um, the fifth step promises actually came true for me. Uh, I can't recite them out of the book, but they're pretty intense promises. And I had thought that it, they were just kind of flowery language, but it didn't really occur. And the fifth step promises did occur for me. And then I became willing to have God remove these defects of character. So we had to isolate defects of character, which are the these, and um, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. So I asked him, and what I used to do was ask God to remove my shortcomings and then work on them. You know, I'm going to work on my shortcomings myself. But... Uh, something that another sponsor had shown me through another round of the steps was we wrote all the defects on one side of the page and then the opposite virtue on the other side of the page. For example, right now there's um, gluttony. The opposite of that is moderation. Um, one is um, laziness. The other is um, productivity. So whatever the defect is, write the opposite on the other sheet of paper, and then she said, fold it over and forget about the defects. I want you to work on these things. So if I work on being productive, I work on moderation, I work on these things, then God removes the defects. It's not for me to remove. If I'm working on my own gluttony, I just keep eating. Um, you know, but if I'm working on towards moderation, that's not what's foremost in my mind and then made a list of the people that I'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Another trick that uh, I had heard and I, I do now with my sponsees is the index cards. It's really cool. You write who you, you harmed on an index card, their contact information, and on the back you write how you harmed them. And um, then as you do the amends, you get to throw the index cards away. So you have none left, and it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> doesn't take much to entertain me, I guess, but, you know, it makes me feel more productive than just crossing it off a list. And in doing, you know, more in-depth inventories, when it says um, my mistakes, I get more and more specific. And the more specific I am, I can really see those harms. And I've taken the index card before and you know, actually looked at it while I was talking, like to my daughter, I did that once, and was pretty specific, and she's like, wow, how did you see all that, that you did that? And I said, that's what this program does. And then um, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. You know, the book tells me how to live. It tells me if I'm worried what to do. It tells me, you know, if I've got you know, indecision what to do how to act, and after everything, it always says help a newcomer, help a newcomer, or help somebody. You know, after it tells you what to do, it says to help somebody after that. And the nightly review, I wish I could say that I'm better at. Um, I'm supposed to do it every night, the written nightly review, and I do it some nights. I need to get better with that. And then in the morning, um, you know, I pray in the morning for God to divorce me from, it says in the book, I forgot, self-pity, I think. But I'll say divorce me from whatever. Divorce me from laziness. Divorce me from self-centeredness. Divorce me from whatever it is I need to be divorced from. And I'll, I'll do some readings. And then also, um, my sponsor has had me start writing. You know what it says when we, we, 
uh, we write down what we're going to do that day. And she said, don't write down the events you're going to do, but how you want to be that day in the event. So if I'm working, I'll say, you know, I want to be focused. I want to be um, kind. I want to be productive. You know, I want to be giving. I, whatever it is I'm doing that day, what attributes do I want to really, you know, exhibit? And so that's been pretty cool when I do it. You know, I've, I've got to do it more. And then step 12, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we carried the message to other alcoholics and practiced these principles in all our affairs. Um, but let me back up to step 11 real quick. I think that meditation itself is great. I meditate all the time, and there's lots of different forms of meditation. And when I felt stuck in the program, what I do is more step 11, and then it makes me unstuck. Um, meditation is great. And so, and then with the 12th step, having had the spiritual awakening, if that's what I'm promised as the result of the steps, then I carried this message to the other alcoholics, and I carried it to also not other alcoholics. And I know what my job is in uh, working with others. It tells me my job. In step three, it tells me I have a new employer, and then working with others says my job now is to be of maximum service to God and my fellows. It doesn't matter what I do that gives me money, but that's my job is to be maximum service to God and my fellows and practice these principles in all our affairs. There's there's a whole new frontier, and Bill wrote a really beautiful pamphlet on emotional sobriety. Uh, so when I'm trying to practice these principles in my affairs, you know, in my home, in my work, in my life, with my kids, that's, you know, that's... a, a playing, you know, a big game, and I try to do that more and more, and, you know, there's workshops and things on emotional sobriety, and, you know, Bill does talk a lot about that, and, you know, I, that's what I'm working on now, um, is, you know, trying to be emotionally sober, you know, as well, and I've got a relative, a close relative that just came in this program, some of you already know, and I, you know, have been informed that I'm codependent. And so, <laughs> so, you know, I'm starting another program now, you know, to try to be, uh, you know, emotionally um, not codependent and try to be emotionally sober in that area. You know, we can be, you know, have advanced in certain areas and still be sick in other areas. And I don't claim to be near, you know, well, you know, I'll be dead when I got it. Um, so I think that um, I want to read something, and then I'm going to end. And I like to end with this um, a lot of times, and it's actually from the 12 and 12. And if you don't know what the 12 and 12 is, it's a supplement to the big book. The big book explains the program of recovery, but there's some good stuff in the 12 and 12 that, that gives some insight on some of the steps. Um, I've tried to work the steps out of the 12 and 12. It didn't work for me because you can't, it's just not formed that way. Um, I, and I know nothing about cars, but it's like if the big book was the manual on how to put an engine together and the 12 and 12, what name one part of an engine? Carburetor, okay. That then the 12 and 12 would be talking about all the different types of carburetors that there are and, you know, what's the best and what goes best with what other doohickey the carburetor attaches itself to. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be able to put an engine together reading that, but you sure might know a little bit more about what carburetor goes better with the doohickey, which will make the engine run good. So the last thing I want to read is from the 12 and 12, and it's, from the uh, page 124, and it says, Still more wonderful is the feeling that we do not have to be specifically distinguished among our fellows in order to be useful and profoundly happy. Not many of us can be leaders of prominence, nor do we wish to be. Service gladly rendered, obligation squarely met, troubles well accepted or solved with God's help. The knowledge that at home or in the world outside, we are partners in a common effort. The well-understood fact that in God's sight all human beings are important, the proof that love freely given surely brings a full return, 
the certainty that we are no longer isolated and alone in self-constructed prisons, the surety that we need no longer be square pegs in round holes, but can fit and belong in God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living, for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possessions, could possibly be substitutes. True ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the deep desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.